My name is Brett Salucci. I teach at MIT in the Civil Engineering Department. I appreciate the chance to address you. Uh, to say at the front end, my strong recommendation is that the council include some very strong conditionality if you go forward with the increase in density. Uh, I think and I'm hoping that the housing study uh, that has been promised to those on the faculty at MIT uh, actually is a productive one and comes to reasonable conclusions by July. But I think the council needs to assure for itself a last look uh, and not prove something before you know what's really coming. Uh, there are a lot of interesting points raised tonight. Let me go back uh, a little bit 40 to 50 years ago. Uh, I've always lived in Brighton. I took the bus to MIT. I got my bachelor's and master's there in 61 and 62. Uh, probably one of the proudest things I feel about things I've had a chance to participate in and I've had a lot of good luck in my career uh, was the opportunity to work uh, supporting Father McManus, uh, Mayor Dan Hayes, Mayor Ackerman in the fight against the human belt, uh, which uh, was a really bad idea, a really bad idea that had the support behind the scenes of the MIT administration, which those of us associated with MIT were very embarrassed about had the support of the Cambridge Planning Board. And when Father McManus, uh, with tremendous patience, uh, put together uh, with Dan Hayes, who was then mayor, uh, was the coalition that reached Tip O'Neill and Ted Kennedy and Mike Dukakis and, and basically turned that issue around, uh, much to the betterment of the city. Why is there such a tremendous economic opportunity at Kendall Square today. I am in favor of taking advantage of economic opportunity, but I'm also in favor of thinking carefully about where that opportunity comes from and how we make sure that it continues. One of the building blocks is the presence of MIT. MIT generates a lot of innovation, a lot of research, and when I was a student there, the economic spin-off from that was tending to show up out at Route 128. Uh, had the Interbelt been built, I think that would have continued. The Interbelt being blocked and the money that didn't go into it, uh, expanding the red line capacity, extending it, uh, and providing money to renovate all the commuter rail system, without the stopping of the Interbelt, the interior would be a total basket case, and you wouldn't have Kendall. The other building block at Kendall was then city manager uh, Jim Sullivan insisted on a parking freeze in the Kendall Square area because he feared, appropriately, that Kendall would have been a parking ride lot in downtown Boston. He didn't protect that land so that development that would benefit Cambridge could occur. So the building blocks include, included stopping the interval and taking advantage of the presence of MIT. If we look at what happened. Uh, I think Cambridge won big. Ironically, MIT won big in spite of the position of the administration, what happened has been very good. What's happened to Father McManus's parishioners uh, and, and, and people of moderate income who lived then and to some degree still are able to live, although it's getting tougher and tougher. Uh, the dimensions we had on the disaster that the Unibel represented were out of magnitude through 3,000 dwelling units in the Brooklyn Young neighborhoods uh, near Central Square, and roughly 1,000 more dwelling units threatened by the proposal to extend Route 2 from Hill Life down through Porter Square and Union Square and river through that part of Cambridge, too. So, order magnitude, 5,000 dwelling units. A terrific study that Brian Spataco put together of the graduate student housing problem at MIT puts a number on it. One of the things they trained us at MIT was to take a look at the numbers. Uh, there are 4, 000, over 4,000 graduate students that don't have housing on campus or near campus. There are at least another 1,000 postdocs. That's over 5,000. Uh, and there are young faculty uh, who 
who used to be able to live near MIT but can't anymore. So the housing needs, which are essential to MIT continuing to function well, have been dumped on the adjacent community in dimension of over 5,000 units. I mean, we got to talk. We, it's nice to say affordable housing. You have to say how much. The deficit in graduate student housing is over five. Uh, graduate plus postdoc is over 5,000 units. Uh, that is a double win. It is a terrible problem for the long range vitality of MIT. This Spataco study shows very clearly how rapidly the rents are escalating and how that's pricing grad students out of the market, creating a real problem for MIT. Presumably, that's what the MIT housing study will focus on, the problem for MIT. The flip side of that problem for MIT is a terrible problem for the Cambridge community. Those 5,000 dwelling units, not because the students are bad people, but they've driven the price of housing for the rest of Cambridge sky high. Uh, Spadaco's study shows that the vacancy rate in Cambridge is as low as any place in the United States except central Manhattan. So I uh, was very pleased at MIT to see the new president turn to Tom Coughlin and ask for a review of the Matinko can, uh, plan. What Coughlin recommended was that the densification go forward because it represented more opportunity but the question of what to do with that opportunity had not been adequately discussed within the MIT community. And we hope, uh, and I believe Tom, because I think he's a very honorable guy, we're going to get a serious opportunity to review that and come to some different conclusions. But it is not just a matter for MIT, it is a matter for Cambridge. So I would urge you to reserve for yourself a last look but I would also not urge you to not let it be a surprise and let's see what comes out of the study. I think a dimension needs to be put on the housing study at the front end that there need to be 5,000 units of affordable graduate student housing either on campus or near campus. It doesn't all have to be at Kendall Square. MIT's got a lot of land resources. It doesn't all have to be on campus, but it certainly should not be buying out existing housing and converting it to student housing, that wouldn't be fair at all. But a, a serious plan to produce 5,000 units, uh, which MIT desperately needs for its own future, but also, I believe, has the chance to make MIT a much better part of the Cambridge community in terms of not driving up the prices. That won't solve the whole uh, housing crisis, Crisis. But those 5,000 units of graduate students now competing for Cambridge housing, uh, being taken care of by MIT, will make a much larger contribution to, the afford to, to solving the affordable housing problem than 13% of a modest number of housing units. That's just tokenism. It's not going to deal with the problem. 5,000 is the dimension that I would urge you to put on the table in advance uh, and ask Phil Clay, who's a very skillful guy that I respect a lot. The, the study is not, I hope, to decide if there's a crisis of affordable housing for graduate students at MIT. It's crystal clear that there is. I hope that the mission is to figure out how to deal with that. And the dimensionality is 5,000 units. I would urge you to get a look at the result of that and make sure there are at least 5,000 units in the solution in timely fashion. Uh, and you, know, you can't get blood out of stone. The economic opportunities by upzoning Kendall are important, but this you have the chance to channel some of that economic opportunity to dealing with the central problem that MIT needs to deal with and that the Cambridge community needs to deal with. Uh, people think I know something about transportation. I'm not going to say anything about it. If you've got questions on transportation, I'll talk about it. I decided to talk about housing because I think it's the central issue.